about our wonderful gardens? Yes. Of course. Bradley's would have kept uh, a kitchen garden with uh, various vegetables that they would eat throughout the year. Things like beans and beets and carrots and peas, potatoes, and these types of things that uh, would be growing all by yourself uh, as there were no grocery stores, no Dominion or A&P to go to. You produce everything that you needed. Uh, besides a uh, kitchen garden, it would have uh, probably a, a herb garden for medicinal purposes. Um, some herbs are used for, for flavoring, so uh, culinary use, others for medicinal, and still others are, are good for dyes if you're dyeing the wool that you're cleaning, the first of all. Quite fortunate that we have members of the Cloverleaf Garden Club that look after the, the gardens for us now. Yeah, they're looking very good. I want to just wait. I'll get a, get a draw knife and do something with the shaving horse. All right. One of the things that we do at the museum is to demonstrate types of typical daily activities, whether it's carding wool or spinning, or the gardening activities, and then some of the other things that maybe say the more manly types of jobs. But, um, things like woodworking, uh, what I'm sitting on right now is called a shaving horse or shaving bench. Uh, works on the principle of leverage and that there's a, an adjustable head that you can raise or lower depending on the size of the piece that you're working on. And then push down the piece and clamps into place. And you can use things like a draw knife to do some shaving. all kinds of things from different tools, tool handles, shingles, all the shingles for shakes of a, a roof had to be all done by hand. They'd be split out of a block of cedar and then you use the draw knife to kind of shape it, smooth it down so that they will fit snugly one on top of the other. So one of the things that we do in March, especially during the March break, is manufacturing of maple syrup. Well, one thing that I could make out of something like this would be a sap spile, which will end up looking somewhat similar to this. In the spring, you tap the maple trees, put the spile in, the sap drips down into your buckets, which you then collect and boil over the open fire. So I use the draw knife to, to give it some shape. Use a, a brace and bit drill a hole into the end, the sap goes somewhere to flow, and then a chisel to hammer it all out to dig the, the groove down so that the sap will then flow. So, so just a little thing that uh, you can help to while away the hours well, you're waiting for your crops to grow and everything else is looked after at time.
We're in the barn now. Um, Bradley's being farmers would have had a, at least a large barn for storing grains and some livestock. We've got a few items out on display right now from a little buggy and a cutter to a threshing machine and a fanning mill used in the production of of grain, taking it from the grain in the field to the, the finished grain that would then go to to the mill to be ground into flour. The other building that's on the site of the museum grounds is the anchorage that uh, was moved here in the 1970s from its previous location, foot of South Down Road, right on the water's edge. Uh, uh, was named the Anchorage apparently by John Skinner, who was a retired commander of the Royal Navy, who retired at the age of 76 and came to, to live in Upper Canada about 1839. So according to the family history, he's reputed to have said that, you know, here, this is my Anchorage, here I will retire. So the name of the Anchorage has stayed with the building all these years. Architecturally, it's known as a Regency style cottage and that it has uh, the large windows to allow light in and an overhang, sort of a large overhanging eaves to, to prevent some of that sunlight from, from heating up the house too much. Uh, it's a style that was uh, favored among the British Army. Uh, it has its origins in the Far East, uh, sort of the bungalow of the Raj and stuff in India. You find it, some examples of it in the Caribbean and then again in Ontario. You don't seem to find it anywhere else in, in North America. So a very, I guess, strong British influence and style. We think that it was even uh, built or at least designed by a military engineer. It's heavily timbered, hand-hewn beams, sort of extra structural things that aren't typically required in a house. Uh, it's even a possibility that it was originally designed and used as uh, an officer's quarters and then subsequent to that was used as a home. Uh, there's a bit of a, a oral history or even a local history in the connection with the Jarvis family who owned the property where this, the, the Anchorage came from. And that, uh, around 1816, one of the, the Jarvis sons was married and his father, uh, I guess, bought a house in Toronto and floated it out by scow from, from well, what was York, it wasn't even Toronto then, floated it out by scow and pulled it up on the beach and, you know, that was a wedding present. So the Anchorage came from that same parcel of land that, uh, that was given to the son. Over the years, it's, uh, it's been a home, an office, summer cottage, and then lastly, a warehouse for sewer pipes. The, the National Sewer Pipe Company owned it and used it for for their office purposes, and then they outgrew that and they just sort of relegated it to storage space. In uh, well, from the 19, late 1970s through to uh, the early 1990s, uh, staff and volunteers of the Mississauga Heritage Foundation worked diligently in trying to get monies raised to, to do the restoration work on it. Uh, there was a feasibility study done mid, in the mid 80s. Finally, uh, in early 1990, uh, all uh, the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted and the funding was, was sort of earmarked and put in place. The restoration and renovations began in 91 and then we opened the building officially to the public in 1992 as Mrs. August's first year-round museum facility. Bradley Museum had been opened in 1967 but was, was opened sort of seasonally, uh, being closed in the winter months because of the lack of central heat. Whereas uh, the Anchorage being a more modernized building in that it has display space, office space, storage, and, and uh, gift shop, tea room areas that allowed us to be uh, more flexible and, and provide more services to the public. Um, could you just give me your name and tell me what you do? My name is Scott Gillies. I'm currently the marketing and fundraising coordinator for the museums of Mississauga. Excellent. Um, could you uh, tell me the historical significance in, in Mississauga of, of the museum we're in right now, which museum it is, and sort of the, the history 
not bad enough until where it is right now. Okay. Well, we're in, in Bradley House, Bradley Museum, which was opened in 1967 as a centennial project to recognize Canada's 100th anniversary. The house uh, was built in the 1830s by Lewis and Elizabeth Bradley, who were some of the early settlers of Toronto Township. It was lived in by them and then subsequent other families up until the late 1950s. Uh, yeah, but at that point, it was located on the uh, oil refinery. Uh, it, originally, it was the British America oil refinery, and then uh, later became Gulf Oil. Now it's Petrocan. But in the uh, late fifties, early nineteen sixty, uh, it was a corporate decision to to vacate all of the the houses, all the families that were living on the refinery property. So uh, the house was actually then purchased by Ken Armstrong, who was the original owner of the Mississauga News. And he in turn then donated it to the Township of Toronto with the proviso that it be turned into a museum. So a group of, of volunteers got together, formed uh, the Township of Toronto Historical Foundation, which was the precursor of the Mississauga Heritage Foundation. They worked together for six, six and a half, seven years to do the renovations, restoration on the house. Um, different people from Fort Credit area and Clarkson all got together, young and old. Um, there was even somebody who was well into, I think into his 90s, who showed up every day with his toolbox and he brought in his, his molding planes and stuff and was able to reproduce some of the, the original trim. Uh, they opened it uh, in June of 1967, and then it has been in operation ever since as, as a public museum. Um, one of the other spin-offs from this, this group of volunteers besides Mississauga Heritage was also the Mississauga South Historical Society. So, so the two groups kind of came together as one to, to help save Bradley House and, uh, and then have gone on to, to do great things on their own as well. Excellent. What's the, the present day role of, of this museum? Well, currently uh, we're, uh, the house is restored to the 1830-1840 time period, furnished that way. So what we're doing in these days are sort of helping to convey the message and the history of what early Toronto Township and early Upper Canada was like. Uh, the but pretty well all the possessions are not original to the Bradley family, but they are typical of the time period. So they give people uh, a good overview of sort of the, the everyman view of, of Upper Canada history. Uh, Bradley was not politically motivated. He wasn't active that way. He, he was a, an adjutant in the local militia, but uh, basically, he farmed, raised a family, and uh, you know, was a, a good uh, member of the Methodist congregation, according to his obituary. Um, you know, like the room that we're in right now was, was likely used for, for church services and stuff when uh, the pre Saddleback preacher came around occasionally. But um, it's a chance for people to come kind of experience uh, a quieter time, a quieter life. Um, maybe in some cases, it allows them to, to get in touch with their, their own personal roots. We found that visitors or new citizens of Canada come and, and really enjoy the, the chance to, to, to learn about the history of Canada, but then it also uh, allows them to sort of relive certain memories of their own. Uh, some families have sort of grown up in somewhat similar conditions to what we're portraying right now. Uh, others, it's a, sort of a step back in time to their own childhood. Uh, so they are bringing you know, their own children and grandchildren to, to share some of that experience with those people too. Excellent. Thank you. We're now at uh, Benares Historic House. We're inside the visitor center, modern visitor center that was built here to accommodate uh, our visitors to the site. And uh, the room that we're in right now is our orientation gallery. It gives people an opportunity to, to meet some of the Harris family who lived here in the 1830s, the 1850s and so on. 
up until uh, the present time with the, the fourth generation family that lived here uh, in the 1970s. And also a chance to, to learn more about the connection that Venerius has with the, the Jauma novels that were written by Mesa de la Roche in the, the mid 20th century. Venerius is, is unique in that it was home to four generations of the same family uh, before it was then donated to the Ontario Heritage Foundation in 1968. And then um, in 1995, uh, after a considerable period of time of uh, planning and uh, various delays, then it was opened as a museum to the public uh, and is now owned and operated by the city of Mississauga. Uh, what we're gonna see today is everything that's original to the house, to the family that lived here. We'll go on a, a walk to the, the back of the six acre site. The house as you see it today is uh, what was built in 1857. Originally when Captain Harris bought the property in the 1830s there was a stone house, an elegant stone house and several outbuildings including different log cabins on the farm. So he apparently uh, sold his commission in the British Army in order to, to afford to, to buy the property. So he and his wife Elizabeth uh, raised their eight children on the property here. And then around 1850 there was a fire and part of the house was destroyed. Uh, the summer kitchen that's on this house uh, is all that remains of that, that first house. So we'll be going into the home that way. Uh, so they built a second house, you know, just sort of in behind this area. And around 1855, there was a second fire and that house was completely destroyed. And so they, the home that they, they have now is, is the one that was built in 1857 and has survived all these these years since then and it's it's changed very little from the original design uh, when arthur harris inherited it in the 1880s they made some minor uh, alterations to the front porch but otherwise everything else is basically the way it uh, was originally designed um, sort of some modern upgrades as i say just prior to the first war with the installation of some running water on the second floor and some central heating. But uh, basically it's it's stayed the way it is and uh, is a testament to the builder. The, uh, the 1918 time period is is when there were three generations of the family living together. By the 1880s, Arthur and his wife, Mary, had inherited the, the farm from his father. Out of the eight children, Arthur was the one son who actually lived to, to live long enough to inherit the property. Um, his uh, older brothers had both died through early in life, and uh, other sisters, uh, actually, he's the only one of the whole bunch of them that uh, that married and had any children. He uh, had two other sisters, older sisters, who lived in Toronto, never married. He had one that, uh, that did get married and, and moved to the Paris area of Ontario. But uh, he was the one who, who got the property. So by 1918, uh, he basically retired from farming. Uh, they were renting out some of the land and making a bit of a, an income that way. But as you can see from this old portrait, or photograph, of, well, they kept a few chickens, geese, ducks, uh, peacocks uh, in the, and around the farm here. Uh, still used horses. To, there's a stable here where they would uh, keep a team. It was Dexter and Darkey with the name of the two horses. Arthur and Mary had two daughters. One of them, the oldest one, was Annie, as we see here. Annie and uh, her husband, Beverly Sayers, got married prior to the war and had uh, two children by this time period. Jeffrey, who we see is uh, pushing the lawnmower, which we still have in the collection, was about 12 at the time, and his sister Dora was around three. They had moved back here 
to be with her parents, with Annie's parents, uh, while Beverly was off helping to fight the war. Annie's sister was Naomi, who uh, they never married, but uh, chose to stay here and sort of be the, the farm manager, the household manager, property manager, uh, look after her parents as they grew older. But, um, when she passed away in 1968, then uh, she left the, the house to her nephew and two nieces. And so they decided in 1969 to then donate it to the Ontario Heritage Foundation as one of the first properties of that organization. And uh, Jeffrey uh, stayed here, lived here until 1974, at which time he then chose to, to move out. Um, and then other families were brought in as sort of custodian caretakers to maintain the property. And then um, in the early 90s, they began the restoration work, archaeological excavations, and, uh, and then it was opened in 1995 as a public museum. I'm talking about archaeological excavations. Uh, a team of archaeologists headed up by the Ontario Heritage Foundation did uh, extensive digs all around the property, around the, the perimeter of the house to try and find the footprint of the original house that was destroyed with the fire. Uh, they also found various dump sites and uncovered uh, approximately 90,000 pieces of items. Some of them complete uh, from bottles uh, uh, to more you know, broken shards of, of pottery and porcelain, uh, even to a set of false teeth that were found in the outhouse. So it was a big case somebody forgot to remove them before they had to dispose of some something inside. But this allows us a chance to uh, to get an understanding of sort of the, the daily life of the Harris family. It's it's the day to day dishes that get broken and get discarded, and you know, it's only the good dishes that get kept. But uh, because there was no sort of weekly garbage pickup like there is today, then everything was disposed of on the site. This is the, uh, is the dining room of the house. Uh, I like to start here because I, I enjoy eating as much as anybody else. So it's, it's a comfortable room. Uh, we haven't got it set up as, as a, actually a dining room table, uh, just to show that you know, our family actually were living here. So uh, things like the, the table tennis. There are the good dishes still around. The large commanding portrait that we have here is of uh, Reverend McGraw, who was the, the first Anglican rector of Toronto Township and uh, one that founded St. Peter's Church, the corner of Dundas and, and Mississauga Road. And he was the uh, grandfather of, of Mary McGraw, Mary McGraw Harris, who had married Arthur. He had a house that was uh, similar in style to Benares, and, um, whereas this house is called Benares, his house happened to be called Arendelle because of his Irish background. The name Arendelle has uh, stayed with the community. Adjoining the, the dining room uh, is the sitting room or parlor. Um, in here, there are three portraits hanging on the wall. One of uh, Major General John Harris, who was like the, sort of the head of the family, was uh, an artillery officer in the Napoleonic era. He had several sons who were involved in the army, different regiments. Uh, this portrait on the left is, is Captain James Harris, who was the one who came here in the 1830s, uh, bought the property, and then built the house that we're now standing in. And it was he and his wife Elizabeth that had the eight children. And out of those eight children, then Arthur was the, the one who lived here at the, the 1918 time period that we're portraying. All the furnishings that you see are original to the to the house, to the family. And uh, 
we were very fortunate in that the, the descendants have decided to, to donate much of their belongings. They've still kept some for their own personal enjoyment. So you have a large bookcase that they were a well-read family. Very artistic, very talented in many different ways. In the main hallway here, we have the wood stove we brought in. While there was uh, central heat with radiators installed by 1913, uh, with the outbreak of the First World War, there was a, a push for people to, to stop consuming coal for household use, but to redirect the coal into factory production. So Arthur uh, bought into the idea and brought the wood stove back in and uh, use this to sort of heat the, the main floor. You know, the large soil pipe goes up to the ceiling and then goes up to the second floor. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, it would help to, to heat part of this area. There's also a working kitchen in the basement that would provide some ambient heat coming up through the floor. This room is the, the, the drawing room, or the, or the ladies' withdrawing room when that they did any artistic things in here, but would withdraw from the dining room into this room to, uh, to have their tea and desserts. Again, there are uh, several portraits hanging in here. The one on the left of the fireplace is that of, of Mary Harris, uh, usually you know, done by Catherine Farncombe, apparently uh, the day of, their, of her daughter Annie's wedding. So it would have been sort of taken place in this room, likely seated between the, the two front windows. We still have the, the settee that she's sitting on as well. To the right of the, of the fireplace is one of Arthur's older sisters, this is Lucy. That particular portrait was, was done by Fanny Sutherland, who was a, a daughter of uh, Captain Edward Sutherland, who, came to uh, the Clarkson community in the 1850s. Fanny went on to return to England and, and do more portraiture over there. Smaller portrait in the corner is that of uh, her oldest sister, Bessie. Um, both Lucy and Bessie lived in downtown Toronto, uh, never married, but uh, I believe were frequent visitors to the household. And when uh, young Jeffrey was, was growing up, I went to UTS in Toronto, you know, the, uh, the Toronto school, then uh, he would often stay with his two maiden aunts. Okay. See, the stove pipe comes up through the floor and then proceeds into the guest bedroom. So this would have been the, the warmest room up here. The stove pipe coming through. The large headboard and everything, very elaborately carved. The very comfortable, protective room. The windows that let in lots of sunlight. And all the young Dora came down with the Spanish flu following the, the end of the First World War, which was a worldwide ep epidemic that actually killed thousands or millions of people worldwide. She came down with this influenza and then was, was nursed back to health in this room. So I guess if I was sick, this would be the place I'd choose to be recovering. master bedroom for Arthur and Mary. You know, it would overlook the, the front of the property. 
Um, one thing about Arthur is that uh, because there had been two previous fires in the home, uh, or part of the home where all of the house was lost, he kept all the important documents and papers belonging to the, to the family at the foot of his bed. So that in the event of a third fire, then everyone would know exactly where to go to, to get the important stuff. Bit of an odd uh, architectural feature in this room are these doors that are built into the wall. When the house was originally designed in 1857, they allowed for the installation of these removable doors so that they, they do open up so that they're bifolding doors, but then they can also be physically removed from the, from the wall so that the two bedrooms, the adjoining bedrooms, could then be opened up, cleared of, of furniture, and then used as, as a ballroom for entertainment. Now, 1857 also coincided with the death of one of the sons uh, who was tragically gored to death by a bull on the farm. So the family probably went into a period of mourning and then uh, we believe never actually used the second floor space for that intended entertainment use, but um, sort of relegated it to the bedroom spaces on a permanent basis. And then over the years, uh, the doors were boarded up on one side and then eventually uh, sort of wall-to-wall, -wall, floor to ceiling bookcases were installed to house the, the many volumes that they were collecting. But adjoining this, this room was Naomi's bedroom. Okay. Naomi spent most of her, her years here as she uh, got older and, and grew more feeble, then a uh, bedroom was, was retrofitted for her in, on the main floor. And the large steamer trunk at the foot of the bed uh, has the initials LLH. This uh, trunk belonged to Lucy Letitia Harris. And we saw Lucy's portrait downstairs. Lucy was, was confined to bed in the wintertime with chill wings. And she, uh, the family had uh, gone to church at St. Peter's and she smelled smoke in the house and she got up and realized that the house was on fire. And she looked out the, the front balcony window and she'd see two men running away and footprints were later found in the snow. And realizing that she was in great danger that the house was going to be destroyed, she dragged out what she could and this uh, steamer trunk was one of the pieces that she managed uh, to get downstairs and outside before the the house was totally consumed. So that was uh, in 1855, the uh, second fire happened. Around 1913 was that time when they were upgrading and modernizing the house. So that, uh, besides the central heating, there was some um, running water installed and uh, sort of a modern washroom or bathroom that was installed. So there's a cloth foot tub in the uh, early form of toilet and uh, running water inside. The Arthur, I believe, tended to use the, the outhouse, um, uh, the wash basins and stuff in his bedroom. When Annie moved back home uh, with Jeffrey and Dora while her husband Beverly was off with the war, and they stayed in this room. Uh, what we've chosen to do here is, uh, rather than just set three beds up here, uh, is to uh, give us a chance to show off some of the toys that Jeffrey and Dora would have played with. Uh, and even some toys that Annie and Naomi had as, as young children as well. The uh, the dollhouse, for example, is is one that Annie and me played with as, as little girls. Um, there's a a letter that was written to Santa Claus in the 1880s asking for him to to bring a, a large playhouse, and uh, they realized though that perhaps if the house that they wanted was maybe too large to fit in his sleigh, then maybe Santa could just leave the money and and Papa could build one for them. 
So I think this is perhaps what Papa ended up building. It's somewhat like a replica of the Darius itself. Hoot is uh, one of the owls who was tormenting the, the livestock around here. And uh, I guess I uh, got into the chickens once too often. Arthur being an avid hunter and member of the local gun club, uh, always kept a shotgun and rifle, I think, near the front door. And so uh, Hoot met his maker. But uh, I always used to uh, sit on a table out in the main hallway there. And so when you got up in the night to go to the washroom, his eyes would follow you as you walked down the, the corridor. This bedroom that we're in is on the main floor. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, when Naomi uh, got older and she couldn't navigate the stairs, then this was, was outfitted for her. But in the 1918 time period, uh, the family had a, a household servant named Carrie. And so this was her bedroom. And it was also probably known as the coming and going room. So that if uh, Perhaps if there were other visitors, guests that had to stay here, then she probably had to give up her room. Uh, if there were any uh, births that happened, it would have happened in the coming and going room. And conversely, if someone was going to pass away, then that often happened in the same space. But uh, you maybe tell by some of the furnishings that it's, or, or the, the seconds or the hand-me-downs that have been relegated to the, to the maid's quarters. It's an earlier type of, of bed that uh, would be typically to, to uh, furnish a house like the Bradley home, um, you know, whereas the, the large, uh, elaborately and ornately carved headboards upstairs are quite a bit different. Talking about Carrie, let's go down to the basement and see her domain in the kitchen. This is where all the, the meals would have been prepared for the household. Uh, large cast iron stove that uh, again worked uh, with wood. Uh, an oven so that you can do all of your roasting in there. And baking. This one also has a, a water jacket for keeping water warm. Uh, not hot, but uh, it was kind of like a reservoir for some water. Because while there's running water on the second floor in the washroom, there's no running water elsewhere in the house, uh, not even in the kitchen. I guess the running water was provided by Carrie, who would run up and down the stairs outside to the, to the pump. Some household gadgets, uh, 1880s, 90s, uh, the, the real era of gadgetry. Uh, some things uh, survived and uh, others have you know, disappeared. Some of the packaging has survived some of the companies as well. But something like this that's cherry pitter, we're doing individual cherries at one at a time for making the pies. A bit of a time consuming thing uh, or other things like for uh, whipping up eggs, scrambling the egg up in the dish before you baked with it. Some of the containers is say uh, companies that are still around, Magic Brand baking powder, uh, Oxo Cubes, St. Lawrence Cornstarch you know, was a major company in the Port Credit area for over 100 years. Then uh, out was Coco, there was a prominent name for a lot of years. Even though we're in the basement, it is fairly light and airy with the large windows allowing a fair bit of light in. So uh, Carrie could do her baking down here or do the laundry. This is fairly early, it's an 1888 wash tub. Uh, and the water would have to be heated on the stove and then 
pour it in here, you put the clothes in the soap pan and then turn the crank and that would draw the, the clothing up around and the little hammer is somewhat like a piano hammer would then beat the, the dirt out of the clothes and then they get squeezed and you had to first put it through the ringer and then hung up outside to dry. Except for maybe some of the, the dainties or the unmentionables that you would perhaps not want the, uh, the uncouth farm hands to see. One feature that's uh, perhaps unique to the house is uh, this dish drying rack that Arthur designed and built. You know, could do all the washing of the dishes probably here on the big table, and then you could just let them air dry. A bit like something that you can buy in Ikea today. Take a peek in the cold room. Wine cellar, Captain Harris's old wheelchair has sort of been relegated down here. And then in the dark corner is back under the original part of the, the house, the, the stone structure dating back to the 1800s. It's the uh, old uh, meat safes, pie safes, or like screen covers for keeping rodents and insects off of the food. And then uh, an early type of ice box. You place the, the block of ice in there. I found harvested the ice from the Credit River. Stored it here in a, an ice house. So a stone building outside. Uh, cold air from the, the ice would then descend into the or the refrigerator area. Or this was known as an Arctic refrigerator. It was patented in the 1880s, 1881 in Toronto. Take a quick peek here in the pantry. To be where you know, you'd store preserves, uh, extra boxes, produce, large uh, cases or trunks here that were actually used to, to ship you know, care packages from, from Scotland and England overseas to, to the family. The portrait of Major General Harris probably came in a crate like this. So, Rather than break it up and use it as firewood, it got turned into a storage bin for potatoes and turnips and such. Yeah. Some of the early uh, packaging again is of interest here. I have Clark's pork and beans and comfort soap, from cream of wheat, and so on. Some things that are still in business all these years later. So, what do you hope to see in the future of the museum? What's the goal? That's a good question. I mean, yes, we do have um, we do have a business plan in place that will uh, see us continue to increase uh, attendance and revenues at, at both museums. Um, like, I guess one one long range goal will be to uh, just to heighten the, the community profile for the museums and for heritage in general within Mississauga and, and surrounding areas. Even though Bradley Museum's been in existence since 1967, this place has been open since 1995, and structurally has been here since 1850s, um, there's still a lot of people who, who haven't heard about the museum. So, so we'll be continuing to, to try and educate the public about that. Um, this is why we do special events um, and offer the, the museum grounds and, and other facilities for for other uses other than just museum visits, whether it's uh, you know, weddings at Bradley Museum or, or um, business meetings here at the Nairns, wedding photography here. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we offer as a way to, to get the, the public to know more about us. I, uh, museums in general uh, need to be continually trying to, 
to educate uh, new visitors, new citizens, uh, young people about uh, the importance of our past in order to to know where you are now, you need to know where you've come from, how far we've come. Um, uh, one of the the old uh, mottos of the city was, uh, with an eye on the past, we look to the future. Uh, uh, it's a, a way to, or a pride in the past, I guess, is what Mississauga had. Um, it's a way of, of learning uh, you know, what your roots are and, uh, and how do you carry on and improve on that situation.